This is the Powered Up Podcast, show 30. I do believe that in art, rules are made to be broken. I do. And so I kind of start there. I, I kind of live my life that way. I think even some of my teachers from when I was younger think, like, why am I a teacher? Because I was a like a rule breaker. I was very ornery. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. This is Ken Ehrman, host of the Powered Up Podcast, and I am here with my co-host, Mr. Matt, far from Rembrandt Rogers. Matt, art, was that your thing when you were a kid? Were you any good at it? Um, no, I was awful. Did I was you like awful. it? Um, I always, like, thought that I would be better than I ever was, and then when I actually sat down in front of, like, uh, a piece of paper or like a sketch pad any of those things i'm like oh this is going to turn out well and then i look at my neighbor and they're actually drawing something you can identify what they're drawing and you have no clue what's going on my paper but i was into like theater and uh like choir so i had like some art ability just More not the with performing the, the visual yeah, yeah yeah it was visual arts and drawing painting even painting my house now, I'm terrible at. So, I wish I had a little bit more skill. Yeah, I was. Uh, I when I was pretty young, I actually really enjoyed um, illustrating, and then I feel like I just wasn't confident in my ability, and I I started to dislike it. I will say my 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 driveway chalk art skills are are uh, are very top notch right now. My son is impressed with anything that I draw. He usually likes cranes and bulldozers and and things like that. But it's also a three year old that's that is uh Your that's critiquing point. me. So the the bar is uh is not set too high in terms of well in his perspective it is. But um, so we in our in our show today we have uh, Kara Bowerman who is an educator from Oklahoma. She's a high school art teacher, and you know Matt and I said to ourselves you know right before it started that we're we're nervous and excited to have an art teacher join us because we think it'll be a great perspective to have uh, a teacher that teaches art at the high school level, but also something that's well outside of our comfort zone in terms of our experience and just, uh, you know, being able to connect with. But the connection happens quick and, and she really shares a lot of, of great insight for us. Do you have anything specific that you want to uh, tease the audience with before we jump into the interview? Yeah, no, I think that, A, she's awesome. Like, I think what she covers has more connections with what my classroom looks like than I ever expected. Um, and it's really kind of interesting from the elementary perspective where you have to master so many things or try to do the best you can to see someone. And we've had conversations with history teachers that love history and math teachers that love math, by all means. But an expressive subject like art where you can see kids come alive and her being such a puppeteer is a bad way to put it. But just it's in her hands to bring out um, the side of kids and empower them. It's it's kind of it fuels you up. It gets you amped up like the idea of being able to see the best side of kids or a side of kids that they don't get they don't normally feel comfortable to express or didn't even know was inside of them. Um, and we hear a lot of the common themes of like being authentic, being real, but you actually get to hear from her perspective of kids taking her class because they're excited to take her class. Um, and that intrinsic motivation being cranked up and the product from that uh, just being really, really neat. So what about you? What were some of your, uh, your takeaways? 
Yeah, I would echo everything you said, and I, I thought she had a really unique perspective on getting students to take risks. And, and I really challenged her to say more than just have a good relationship with, with students because, you know, as I say in the interview, I'm not saying that's not important. That is important, but what's beyond that? There's, there's more to that than just having a good relationship with, with students. And she gives a great answer, and she has a really unique perspective on the topic of respect, especially from a high school teacher's perspective. So, you know, it's this is not a podcast for our teachers. This is fits the fits the mold of everything we do. This is a podcast for all educators to think about ways to change your style of instruction, to change your approach in the way that you are uh, working with students and working with colleagues to really better yourself in your classroom. So uh, let's uh, let's not delay this anymore and jump into that interview with Kara Bowerman. Hi, Kara. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing very well. We're super excited to have you here. We appreciate you joining us over the summer break to record with us. So to kick things off, uh, please officially introduce yourself, share with our audience where you're coming from, and just kind of, you know, who you are as an educator and what your journey has looked like in a snapshot. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, my name is Kara Bowerman. I live in Edmond, Oklahoma. I've been a high school teacher teaching 9 through 12 at Edmond North High School for the past eight years. I teach the visual arts. The classes I've been teaching specifically the past few years consistently are drawing and design. I teach painting. I teach painting too, uh, but I've dabbled in some of the other art classes, but that's kind of where I, my groove is at. Um, I also am the head girls cross country coach and then I'm the head girls track coach. So I stay really busy with coaching, especially in the spring with track. Um, but my, I just feel like I have these totally two different worlds, this like art world and I'm just, just this art teacher and I'm really artsy. And then I go out in the dirt and the mud and the wind and the elements and, and just completely change into a different person halfway through the day. And um, I love it. And I do that because that's what I did when I was a student. I was an artist and then I was a long distance runner. And whenever I was thinking about what jobs I could do where I could do art and run. And as far as I know that, you know, I guess I could be a performance artist while running. Haven't quite figured that out. But other than that, you know, teaching and coaching seemed like the perfect avenue for me. So I decided on that and pursued it and, and it's been a great fit and I've, I've really enjoyed it. So uh, the students that you're working with in your art classes, are they exclusively electives? Yes. Yeah. My classes are electives. Okay. So you're working with students that are obviously super passionate about the, the content area. So how would you say that you, I'm going to, I'm jumping right out of the gates here. How would you say you harness that, that passion that they're coming in with that you know that they have at least a small, a small piece of, and you're really using that to, to, to your fullest potential to accelerate your course? That's a really good question. I think that the, the very first thing I try to do is just be relatable because I do have a lot of students that get put in my classroom that I maybe was elective choice number five. They may, you know, want in carpentry or they may have wanted in the computer classes and they ended up in my class. And so, um, and these are kids saying, I have no talent at all. I, I don't even want to be in here. And so the very first thing I try to do is, is just be relatable to them in some way, you know, oh, do you like sports because I'm a coach? Um, or just do you like video games because I play video games? I try to relate to them on that level so then at least we can be like, okay, I want to be in your space with you. And then from there, I kind of ease the conversation of, well, if you could make something, what would you like to make? And just kind of go from there, just let it kind of naturally progress. And I think once you build that trust, and you have made it clear to each student that this is a safe place where you can be yourself and you can create whatever you want without any judgment. Um, it can be bad without any judgment. Um, then, I mean, just the, that's when the magic happens. It, it's just with trust and, and feeling safe. I think it's a really interesting thing for, I will say that I have talents uh, similar and different than yours. I ran track in college um art uh, as visual ways uh not necessarily my my talent not uh what i feel most comfortable with but we recently actually had a conversation about having like open-ended projects and the benefits of those as opposed to having um kind of strict guidelines of what they go through and how that's a really good learning environment for kids to 
go through and say, hey, like this is as much effort and as much interest you want to put into it. I guess when looking at building a new project um, or pulling something in, I assume that you provide frameworks and guidelines and things that must be included, but your end goal is not to have 30 of the same piece uh, replicated unless it's a specific skill. What is the mindset that you have going into creating a project that has that balance of not too much structure and having individualism and creativity really flow out, but being able to assess it for the, the key components at the end of the day? Wow, that's a really good question. I feel like it's a really good question for me too. Um, when I first started teaching, I think I was a teacher that was very structured and and I had my rubric was really specific and I was looking for a specific thing. And, and yes, what you get with that is a bunch of projects that look the same and a bunch of students that feel really uh, disheartened. And, and you can almost, if you're too structured, um, you can cause a student to shut down. And I mean, that that's my worst fear as an art teacher is to be that overbearing that I have a student that doesn't want to create. And I think, you know, being so structured like that just came from a place of being a new teacher and being insecure and wanting to just have a lot of control in my classroom. Um, and over time, once I realized that, like, you know, the world's not going to end when, you know, the deadline gets pushed back or we have to change supplies. Once I started getting comfortable, that's when I started just really backing away and just letting the kids be themselves. Um, and so uh, and, and two, just you, you have to be really individual with the student when you're grading. Uh, you'll get probably one like prodigy a year. That's just an amazing art student. That's parents have put them in art classes their whole life and they come in and. Uh, you know, obviously anybody not in the classroom would say, oh, they sh they get 100, and then you have a kid who draws his stick figure family. That's really dramatic, um, but we'll just go with that. And But that's the best that they could do, and you'd think, oh, that really sucks, but uh, you, you really just have to look at the person. And so I say in my classroom, I say if you try, then you succeed. And so I try to assess based on the effort that they're putting in, um, and that does take time to, to learn uh, the ability of the student and learn the talent level of the student. And so I try to not look at the product at all, and I try, I can appreciate it, um, but I try to just really look at the process and what the student put into making that and and, and grading off of that. And, and my grading's gotten a lot easier over time because I've just, once you get to know them and you know they're really putting themselves out there, it's hard to, you know, stifle that or criticize that. Well, and, and just to follow up on that, I so I'm a fourth grade teacher, and the best comparison I can have is grading writing because mm -hmm. grading writing. I was writing thinking the same thing, Matt. Is so subjective to, uh, yeah, you have kind of a concept of what they've done before, but they're not rewriting on the same topic that they recently wrote about. So you're dealing with outside factors of higher. Uh, intrinsic motivation, maybe a better night's sleep, all of those outside factors, maybe you're writing at a better time of day. I, one of the things that I can never get, a, I have friends of mine who uh, studied art education and are art teachers, and they did a ridiculous amount of work in college. And I know that being an art teacher requires a lot of work and um, respect for elders and, and, and kind of previous pieces, as well as um, just like keeping up with trends. It seems like something you just need to be on top of what is current as well. How in the world do you, and this is just a curiosity question, evaluate an end product of, oh, I can tell this student put 40 minutes into it compared to a student that went home and spent three and a half hours for four days straight kind of creating something that could look similar. Okay, so how do I assess like one student that puts more time into a project? Versus, yeah, like is it for me like I minimum? can I, me being familiar with a kid's writing allows me to know that they they have improved, but it's not on that same measuring stick. How is it just a visual eye? Is it just kind of based off those guidelines um that you can pick up on the quality of work um beyond just knowing your students? Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I've never really thought about it before. But yeah, I do think it kind of is just being able to look at it and, and knowing how much work, 
went into that probably probably because you like you said um you know i've had to put that amount of work into pieces and you kind of just know what that looks like after a while um so yeah i do think that that's a lot to do with it other than the student communicating i put this much time into it um yes you can tell and and you can tell so much to a point that if you haven't had a really long deadline for a student and you get a piece like that you kind of wonder is this a piece from a different class or is this a piece from last year yes that definitely comes up that's really interesting i haven't thought of that before but yeah i say just definitely I mean, that's kind of objective, but yeah, looking at it. Do you ever use peer review? Because I had the same connection, Matt, as I said, that I, writing clicked with me right away as a, as a fifth grade teacher. And I, I hated grading writing. I mean, that was the bottom line. I loved conferencing with kids. I loved evaluating their writing. I loved providing feedback and giving them opportunity to grow. And I loved teaching writing. But when it came to assigning a letter grade or a percentage grade to an assignment, I absolutely despised it. Because I remember as a student, I'll never forget in high school, I turned in what I thought was the best story I'd ever written in my life. I was always like a mediocre writer. And I got a B- minus on it. And it devastated me. Because the teacher didn't like the way I, I changed perspectives like of narrator back and forth in the story for a reason. I, it was the way I wanted to write my story and she didn't like that. And it devastated me because like I said, I thought it was the best thing I ever wrote. And so I've always been very hesitant with the way that I write. So circling back to what I first said, I use a lot of peer review. I have them evaluate each other, not necessarily for a letter grade, but again, for that, that feedback and to get just somebody else's perspective. Is that something that you're incorporating in your class? And if so, how do you do that? Yes, so we, at the end of the project, I the grading is, is not a peer reviewed type of like grading. I grade it, but they do get feedback from each other because we sit in a circle, we go out in the hallway, or um, there's this little area by the environmental class that has these plants that, that teachers put in the hallway and we'll go sit by the plants. But I try to remove them from the classroom and we take our stools with us and send a circle and we do critique. And so each kid will show their art and kind of just share as much as they want to. I really don't like pushing people to, to share more than they want. I think I was one of those students that I had social anxiety. So I am aware of, of the students that have that, um, but just try to encourage them to do a little bit, say a little bit. And so the minimum for critique and they get a grade for critique is they just have to talk as much as they want about their artwork, especially if it's a personal artwork and they don't want to share a lot. I'm not going to push that. But if they do want to share um, a lot of personal stuff, it's a really great time where I get to hear these stories about these kids and uh, their classmates do too. Um, but then everybody gets two points they have to talk two times during the entire critique about anyone's artwork and so they they get feedback that way it kind of starts our very first critique will kind of be like i like the color i like the line and so i make that off or i don't it's not the office what anchorman joke i say we're not gonna do I like lamp. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to say like more than that. And so, yes, critique is a great time that once we get past that I like lamp phase, uh, we really have some good discussions. And, and I have a really good project during De Dia de los Muertos where they kind of share about people and their families that have passed or just people in society that have passed that, that had an impact on them. And man, that is my favorite critique of the year. It is so moving and and I learn a ton about the kids um, during that critique. So something that I think art in general in schools has done really well and has not given up is the art show. I've never been to a school or a district that doesn't have some sort of art show. And the reason I say it that way is it's become more and more evident. The more you hear is real world application and how does this apply and and you know, getting outside of the classroom walls. And that art show is a huge piece of that. So what would you say, being an art teacher and, and going through that process, how does the art show motivate your students? How do you feel it brings benefit to your classroom? And just, you know, is it something that more subject areas should be doing? And if so, why? 
Okay, these are all really great questions. I like them. Um, the art show is such a thing. I like that we're just like <laughs> the art show. We all have one. Yes, we you have, all have the, the same art name show. too. It's it's the art show. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the art show. Uh, yes, we have the art show, and uh, it, it's it's fantastic. We work towards it all year. We actually we have a little midterm art show. We call it Tiny Art Show, and that was a joke. Uh, between me and another art teacher, she said, should we do it? Because our classes are mostly semester classes. So after the fall semester, she said, well, should we do like a end of year art show? And I, you know, I'm tired. So I said, yes, if it's tiny, we can do something. And so we coined tiny art show. So it's an art show with literally tiny pieces of art in it. And we put it in the library and people love it. But other than tiny art show, we work towards the art show the entire year. And, and I think they kind of have it in the back of their head that this could go in the art show if, if it's really good. And then when the art show comes, um, I, it, it's just, I don't know, it's different. It's, I think we're in a time where it's, it's kind of hard to put yourself out there and maybe not on, on social media so much, it's kind of easy to post, but to actually take an artwork that you've made and you put your heart and soul in and you put time in and you're going to set it out there for 2,000 of your peers to see, that's really putting yourself out there. That's different than just posting something. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a vulnerable time, but it's always received really well. Um, I think because art is just a, a thing that makes people connect. And so we, um, our administration is great. It allows all of the classes to come through. We have it in our gym. It's during the day and teachers can bring, English teachers, math teachers, um, science teachers can bring their classes down and go through the art show. And um, it's, it's, it's magical. It's pretty amazing. But I mean, that's the power of art. That's why it's the art show. I think that's a, a really good point. I, I love in the elementary school, obviously seeing kids proud of their work and our art teacher is one of the unsung heroes of our building. Um, but it makes a building feel so homey. And, I, and it's really hard to describe the power. Uh, like I can appreciate art and I can appreciate pride and I can appreciate the different pieces that they work on. But it also just brings this almost like aura of just like homeliness and just comfort and just pride into the building. It's, it's really, really cool. Um, yes, that's awesome. To kind of lead into your end, I, I think as regular ed teachers and, and maybe teachers of different specialties, we have different cohorts where we can I can t go and talk with a few grade level members that all teach the same thing as me. And, and you're a little bit on your own wing. You obviously have an art department, but you probably don't have too many... Um, colleagues that teach identically like you um, because there's so many things to teach art history and, and each of the different uh, kind of facets of art. What is your real inspiration um, or source that you get new ideas and really how often do you turn over um, curriculum? Because I feel like art teachers are constantly just coming up with incredible ideas and figuring out a way to make a kindergarten do a piece that looks like a fifth grader, a fifth grader look make a piece that looks like a ninth grader, and a, a high school teacher or high school student make a professional piece of art. It's incredible to see that my kid that sits in my classroom created that at the end of the day. Um, so not only are you guys incredible at finding inspiration, but also figuring out a way to make it manageable that I think we could all benefit from your ways of driving up interest, giving skills and technique, and really supporting the learners that we all could take benefit from, even if we are not really teaching visual arts in our classroom. Cool, I like that. Um, so I do, I work in a department of five, which is a, a really big art department, especially in Oklahoma. Um, my high school's been really great at, at building our art program. So between the five of us, uh, we do some, our school works in a PLC, so it's a positive learning um, committee. And so we have like our art PLC and we share ideas once a month, we meet together, but man, we're in constant, dialogue with each other in terms of 
if I have a challenge, I can I can walk over to my neighbor or the, another one that I'm in contact with a lot is on the other side of the building. So I'll call her up and say, hey, I'm having an issue with them not understanding this. What do you recommend? And she'll say, oh, I've got this great worksheet or I've got this great slideshow that w helps them learn how to draw a car in two point perspective. Um, so usually if I'm if I run into something that needs refining, I can usually do that within my building, but if I want to change my curriculum or I'm inspired to change my curriculum, usually that's on social media. It's it's reaching out. Um, I'm in a few Facebook groups that are our educators, and they're really great about sharing projects they're doing in their own classrooms, and you know, you look at that. I've, I, one example of that is I saw a teacher do a copy machine self-portraits. It takes, you know, like a lot of work to, to get photos from the kids and print photos of the kids, and she was just sticking the kids on the copy machine or she had like a plexiglass they could hold up to their face um, and was just taking pictures of them like that and then they were doing a grid drawing to transfer it and I remember thinking like that's crazy and also you know teenagers they're so weird about how they look in photos and so just being like we're all gonna look ugly okay let's just get that out there we're gonna be ugly so let's not try to look cute so we can move through this part of the unit and so I did the copy machine self-portraits and it was it was so fun and so I would say I'm definitely inspired by other teachers um, and then other times I'll just randomly maybe just being a creative person um, art teachers being creative people in general but I'll just kind of get an idea in my head for a, an assignment and I'll kind of just throw it together like that and and so I do have a couple of units that I I would call like my original lesson plans other than that I have stolen other stuff from people in a good way well, do you feel like by any means I think that we deal as a household of teachers we deal with the outside pressures of this incredible fourth grade teacher did this I could never do that um, do you feel like it's more of a community of everyone really for like just bouncing ideas off of or kind of like a, a, a competition almost of showing off? Because I think that's a, a difficult thing, especially as a new teacher um, side of things to be like, if I'm in that community, then I need to be creating and, and producing even better stuff. Oh my gosh, that is too funny. I would definitely say that my PLC, we are, we're all friends with each other. I would say we probably do have some healthy competition, but nothing, nothing negative. Um, but yeah, we, we are really eager to show off stuff, but you know, we share a lot of students, um, the art one teachers, you know, they begin with some of the students that I get by the time they come in drawing and design and painting and painting too. And so, um, you can't take total credit for the kids, but yeah, you do kind of, um, I do think we have like a healthy competition where we just, we want to show off, I think, and I think that comes from us, you know, being artists and wanting to create the best product that we can, and then, you know, doing that vicariously through our students, and so, yeah, we do have that. That's funny, but we definitely, I think it, when they graduate, we all take credit <laughs> for them, but we definitely have like our little our little pods of students. Um, I'll have like some kids that are great at painting and they'll take one ceramics class and then they're like in the ceramics cult and I'll lose them to ceramics, but you know, they just kind of follow their own paths. But yeah, at the end of the day, I would definitely say like the department and the school kind of just takes credit for just creating this well-rounded or not even creating, but supporting this well-rounded kid. What would you say <clears throat> is a way that you inspire students to take risks because you did mention that earlier i had kind of had that assumption you know going into today that's that's just incredibly important in in any of the arts um, i taught stem for a short period same exact principle it was it was super important for students to feel safe to take take risks is there anything tangible in the sense of like specifically that you can describe that you think you do in your classroom that encourages that and i'm really going to challenge you here and say outside of having a good relationship with students and i say that because that's super important but that's like that's usually what everybody says so is there anything beyond that that is tangible that we can start to think about in the way that we approach our teaching to encourage students to legitimately take risks okay that's a really great question um i would say so in terms of of lots of different subjects and lots of different grades I'd have to think about that but I do I would start with like in my classroom I do believe 
that an art rules are made to be broken. I do. And so I kind of start there. I, I kind of live my life that way. I think even some of my teachers from when I was younger think like, why am I a teacher? Because I was a like a rule breaker. I was very ornery. And, um, you know, as I've gotten older, I've, I've directed that towards my art. Obviously, I'm a functioning member of society. <laughs> but um, I... I always tell them if it doesn't hurt anybody and it doesn't offend anybody, the answer is yes. I say that all the time because they'll say, can I use Sharpies on this? Yep. Can I use watercolor? Yep. Can I use acrylic? Yep. I, I literally say yes to everything as long as it's not like dangerous. Um, and yeah, I, I literally say yes to everything. It's almost a joke. And I also make art in the classroom alongside them when I have free time. You know, I, I'll lecture and they'll need help the next couple days and then they work. And so if I'm caught up on stuff, I'll, I'll start doing stuff with them. And my art is insane. I am like pouring wood glue on my art. I'm spraying bleach on it. I mean, I am just crazy with my art. And so they see that. Um, so I, I'd say it's like a little bit of modeling and then a lot of like, do it. Yep. Do it. I don't care. Do this. And so I just try to, I don't know. I try to let them just experiment. And so I know in other classrooms, there needs to be a little more structure than just saying yes to literally everything. But I don't know. I would say just say yes more. But you can, I'll say that you can apply that to, to your classroom. Um, because when I would have opportunities for creative projects, I would typically same take the same approach. But even just the the comfort in them doing something without uh, permission beforehand is a step towards taking risks. I mean, I in the beginning of the year, I would tell to my say to my students, "Don't ask me to use the bathroom. Don't ask me to drink water. Don't ask me to blow your nose. Don't ask me to sharpen your pencil. Don't ask me. Just make it." Make a decision yourself. And if you're doing it at a time constantly that I think might not be the best choice, I'll let you know. And and I would still have students come up and ask simple questions like that. Like, hey, you know, Mr. Arman, I finished this. Can I move on to that? And I would just look at them and say, don't ask me that question again. Like, just go do it. Like, use your instincts. Start to make these decisions yourself because I wanted them to have that ability to make choice. And that kind of circles into that conversation, Matt, we had with with Kyle on, on UDL. But still, that, that same concept of, of taking risks, are they taking a risk by sharpening their pencil? No, because it's a safe space, but that idea of just just trying it and almost like asking for forgiveness instead of permission. I mean, that was kind of the message that I wanted my students to have to understand how to do that. I was a very creative teacher. I, I'll say I am a very creative teacher because I took risks and sometimes I asked for forgiveness not for permission but i did it in like like you said kara i did it in a mature way i did it in a safe way i did it in a way that was motivated to create better learning experiences and your your students i would assume are doing the same thing with their art they're doing it because they think it might create a better product not because they just want to be you know they just want to joke around Mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah that's yes it does that's fantastic i honestly might even use some of that in my classroom just saying just (laughs) do it ask for forgiveness later i mean i honestly think that might make better art so i think experimenting is a huge part of the art process and again as long as everybody else is safe try it do it we had an early conversation um i think it was our third episode where we talked through um the idea of the time that they're with you is free education and they can try and attempt and um, push boundaries, but it's safe and free. And when they leave, then it becomes expensive with repercussions, all those different things. And I just feel like your classroom is very liberating, especially for an uh, age range that needs that boundary pushing of kind of freedom and expression and all of those kind of features that I, I just imagine that you see kids come alive that a lot of teachers don't get to witness. Um, and that's got to have a huge impact on you as well. I, I know we were reading a little bit before, but the kids have been a huge motivating factor to you, like all teachers, but being able to witness um, a variety of kids kind of come into your their own because of the structure you created 
has to have some sort of impact and, and in that longevity of pushing through the challenging times um, to, to really surprise you a lot. Is that something you kind of speak to? Yes, yeah, that that honestly makes me a little emotional because it's it's right on target. I do get to see a side to the kids that I don't think a lot of teachers get to see. Sometimes I don't even think their parents get to see because, you know, they may not feel, you know, safe enough to express themselves the way they do in, in my classroom at home. And so I do try to make my classroom a place where they do feel free and 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 open and expressive. And I do that because that's what my art teacher in high school did for me. It was sometimes the only reason I came to school was to go to my art class. And I would. I'd go to art class and then I would go home. And, and that's all I could get myself to do. And so, and, and that is why I became an art teacher because I was just like, where, what was the one thing I loved? Where was the one place I loved? And I loved being in the art room. And so I went back into the art room and I've stayed in the art room. Um, but, and I, I try to do that same thing for my kids. And so I do, I do have these great conversations and, and even, even if it's not a conversation, if it's just looking at their artwork, that's seeing a side of them that not very many people get to see and, and getting to be a part of that and being trusted to be a part of that is really special and, and does keep me motivated. I feel like as a, an elective or as a special at our level, um, that things like art and music are not at, seen at the same importance in a school. And it sounds like your administration doesn't have that perspective, which is a wonderful thing. Um, there's an element of like, as an elementary do it all teacher that I say, oh, math and reading are the highest priorities and science and social studies are next tier. And then the, the specials are below that. Is there any advocacy that you feel or misnomers that get you frustrated or even things that you wish that us regular ed teachers or primary subject teachers knew that either art is already supporting or ways that kind of encourage students that we don't know to give you guys enough credit. The one area, as you kind of think about that, I am blown away at the amount of prep and materials that you guys need before you start. And I can say that there's a lot of um, stuff that we need in the classroom, but a lot of times my uh, it's idea, process how I can roll it out, and use the materials that are already in the hands of kids. Whereas you have an idea, have to process how you're gonna roll it out and then gather all of the items to be able to, to roll that out that I don't think um, music using through a variety of different instruments and, and materials that we don't give you enough. Um, and I don't wanna say that like in that chain of command that the arts and music really should be higher on that tier of how a lot of us educators view its importance. Okay, um, I think, well, thankfully in my building, I've been really lucky to have a lot of support from my colleagues. I mean, so much so that I, you know, they picked me as teacher of the year, you know, a couple of years back and I went as far as I did. And I'm lucky to be at a school where the program, the arts program is super well-funded. Our music program is, is funded and supported really well too, but it's, it's not like that for a lot of schools in Oklahoma. And so I do have a lot of, guilt for the teachers that don't have the resources that I do and it, it probably is a lot harder for those teachers to make the art room work. I know um, some of my colleagues that I've only ever been at North. I was a student teacher there and I was like I'm never gonna leave here. This place is great. This is where everyone would want to be an art teacher at and I've had uh, other art teachers come in. I had one teacher who had no sinks in her room and she had to use buckets. Um, or I had an oak, old coworker whose art room was in an old locker room. Um, and so I've heard stories of, of what teacher, what other art teachers had to go through. And it's, it's, it is really frustrating. And I, I do feel for those teachers. And I, I hope and I try to advocate that other art teachers in Oklahoma and, and outside of Oklahoma, you know, one day achieve the resources that I'm lucky to have in my classroom um, and at my school. Um, but I personally have gotten a, a lot of support and a lot of recognition. And I think that's just what helps is just people recognizing, oh, what you're doing for these students is so great. Or, um, you know, Johnny showed me this picture that he drew in your classroom and that's really great. Stuff like that's, you know, keeps me 
going pretty well. Just getting kind of recognition from other teachers that like, hey, we're working together is really all I need. Just, you know, we're working hard to make this person a, a, as, you know, successful as they can be. Um, I'd, I'd say the only really frustrating thing I, I deal with from other teachers is just um, pulling my kids out of the classroom to like make up tests or, um, oh, they just happen to, to stay and talk and, and miss my classroom time. So I'd say the, you know, the biggest thing that frustrates me is just maybe other teachers not um, respecting my time with the kids as much as I respect their time with the kids. You know, people wouldn't I think people would say like it's more important they spend all of their time in the math room versus they don't need all 50 minutes in the art room and so I'd say just if there could be a little more just you know equality I guess in terms of you know both of our subjects are important mine's not being tested on mine's not something you can really like assess and and divulge in but it is important in its own way it's just different yeah and and to that note um, I think one, I, I completely agree with both of you about the, the value of it. Um, opportunities for collaboration. So when I was teaching fifth grade, we had a fantastic art teacher. She really, I had, there was always two art teachers in our building and I just always happened to have her and my, my students who didn't seem to really love art in the beginning of the year, by the end of the year, they were just totally into the projects that they were doing. She really motivated them to be excited. I think she really gave them skills to feel that they were good enough to be excited, if that makes sense. Because I, I think a lot of times it's kind of, you kind of see the same thing with math. Kids say, I'm not good at math, so they never feel that they will succeed with math. They don't try. They don't study. Kind of the same with art. They're, I'm not good at art, so they don't try. They don't, they don't get excited or, or uh, work with confidence. We actually did two projects together. So we, uh, they would, um, create sculptures and it was like their fantastic beast. I think it was called, it was just anything that they wanted, wanted to imagine to be. And then they would write a, like a bio or a short story on that beast in my writing class. So it was happening at the same time in both of our classes. And then at the end of the year, my students were writing, uh, uh, picture books, they were writing in my class and they were illustrating in our class for the last month of school. And I think seeing that for the students helped them make that connection of writing and art, but also just seeing teachers collaborate like that, I think is super important. And I, I think, you know, the more that we can do that, regardless of the subjects, it really connects it. It really brings in the reason why we're learning that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if you do anything like that, uh, but I would think like history is a place where, art and history can really connect, you know, whether you're depicting, you're redepicting something that happened in history, or you're trying to, you know, use art to depict things that they're learning about. Yeah, um, I have collaborated with a few teachers. And that's, that's really awesome, especially when I first came to North and kind of, you know, made myself known, I was getting emails from teachers that the, you know them reaching out and saying I'd like to collab I'd like to do more art in my classroom and these are teachers that appreciate the arts and love the arts but don't know you know how to do the art and so I would definitely step in and do that I'd say my longest projects I've kept going we work with the Spanish department when we do our Dia de los Muertos unit and my class does uh, face masks um, and then the sculpture class does alabrijes and then the Spanish classes do ofrendas and they're all, you know, with the same common theme, sometimes with the same person in mind. And then we display all of those together in the library from all three different classes is, is one of our big ones. And then I had another, she's not there anymore, but my best friend, she was my roommate and one of my teammates in college. She wanted to incorporate more, more art into her history classroom. And so we put together, it's really cute. It was like a Ninja Turtle critique from the Renaissance. And so we like had art pulled from like Donatello and da Vin or, um, and uh, gosh, I can't even think of all the Ninja Turtles, Michelangelo. <laughs> Michelangelo we pulled, Raphael, yes, yeah. I should know this. It's all good. So we pulled art from them and put them on little easels and we had like the little Ninja Turtle, but then the actual artist picture. And so they kind of learned about it that way. And, and that was a really fun project, but I hope she's still doing that. I should ask her. But that was, and that wasn't really a collab. That was just asking for advice on how to incorporate art um, into into her classroom. So I, yeah, I do love when teachers reach out and do that. I probably should 
try to encourage that more. So I guess kind of leading from our end and going back to uh, another question or, or kind of comment that um, we were talking about, what are really good teaching um, skills or teaching uh, methods that you feel like you bring into your class on the daily that other student or other teachers could really benefit in art it's it, like modeling as you were mentioning and being able to do it side by side with the kids has to be really empowering to, to the kids you're enjoying this project and so you're actually participating as well but being such a specialty area good teaching is good teaching what are some of those things that you feel like a kindergarten teacher could benefit from, a high school biology teacher could te kind of learn from, or um, anyone in between? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't know if I have like a concrete answer, um, but I would say I think the best thing that I do as a teacher is I earn their respect. I don't demand it. And, and I think that's what I base my entire career on is, is I don't, I don't want these kids to blindly, and maybe it's different when you teach younger and, and for their safety, they need to follow these guidelines. And in, in, in high school, yes, we have our rules too, but for the most part, I want them to want to respect me. I want to earn the respect. I don't want to demand it because I do feel like more and more, you know, um, as we move into modern society, I think you have to earn respect. I don't think people want to blindly follow people anymore. And I don't think it's a problem to question authority. I don't. And so I would just say, be, be a good, respectable person that people want to respect. And, and the rest will work itself out. But I think if you're constantly demanding respect, listen to me because I said so. I mean, that might work for five seconds, but you got a whole year with these kids. I I 100% agree with you. And I think there's a huge difference between acting respectfully and respecting someone. I think that it's important, you know, and I, and, and I, I know you weren't saying the opposite of this. Um, there's a difference between acting respectful towards someone because they are in quotes an authority or because they're older than you or, or just really any person at all, you should act respectfully towards and respecting that person as a leader towards you. And I 100% agree with you that every teacher should be looking at every student that we interact with thinking to themselves, I need to earn the respect of these students in front of me. The longer you're in the game, the longer you're in a school, the faster that's going to happen. I mean, I, I, Matt and I have had this conversation as longstanding older elementary grade level teachers. A lot of times – we already have the respect of most of their students because we a have their siblings or because they've seen us around the school. They've interacted with us, um, but you still have to you have to take that approach. So I, I completely agree with you that there they you need to earn their respect and not because, like you said, because I said so, because I'm your teacher. That's that's not about that's not a valid reason, especially for high school kids that are that are on the brink of, of becoming adults and going into the real world like they shouldn't just respect you just because just because you're a teacher. Um, so, so talking about strategies, talking about some of these project ideas, um, I want to jump into our lesson lens to, to dive deep into something that you do with your students in your classroom. So our first question is, are we going to look at an owner, a unit overview, a long-term project or a single lesson? Um, this is just a single lesson that I, my favorite one. Okay. Uh are there any specifics uh, when it comes to grade level or uh, time of year um, and even like specific uh, subject area within art? Okay, so I do this with all of my classes, no matter what I'm teaching. I've even taught sculpture and done it with my sculpture class in art one. I, I make it work with all my classes. It's the unit I've already referenced a couple times or the lesson um, is my Dia de los Muertos unit. So we do that during like our Halloween and the beginning of November. So we do that during that time. And my classes are all nine through 12 mixed together. We're very special that way. <laughs> and so uh, the nine through 12, just a handful of each thrown in the pot. Awesome. So what are these specific objectives of the lesson? 
So my the objective I use over and over and over in all of my lessons is uh, the student will utilize um, art as a vehicle for human expression. That is like our biggest thing is just expressing ourselves. And then along with that comes with different terminology that we use during the unit. We talk about ofrendas, um, we talk about Dia de los Muertos, we talk about um, sugar skulls. Um, and so they have to have the vocabulary for that. And then um, their objectives comes with like the, the mediums that we use. And whenever I have smaller classes, I actually do plaster masks where they pair up and they put plaster on uh, plaster strips on each other's faces. We leave like the nose open <laughs> so they can breathe. But um, when I have really, really big classes, I'll do like canvases. Um, but I love when they can be hands on and trust each other to like put, put the plaster strips on their faces. Um, so yeah, the first thing is just expression, you know, what I'm getting out of this, then they need to know their vocabulary and then they need to understand how to use the medium. And, and you kind of talked about it uh, already, but any other enhancement in what uh, kind of the student role is from beginning to end, the research, uh, kind of uh, each of the different phases of different projects that they're doing, anything that you could um, talk about like students specifically are actively doing okay so from the beginning you know we go over an overview of it I actually um, did a series of my own sugar schools when I was in college because um, I experienced a death of someone close to me for the first time in my life and oh my goodness I did not process that um, very well or I had a very difficult time doing that and and so it is a heavy unit it's a heavy topic but I try to uh, make it be a, a a point in these students' lives where they can process grief in a healthy way. And so we talk about that. And then um, after we go through, you know, the, the basics of the holiday and, and, and my series that I did and the inspiration behind that, then I say, you know, think of someone close to you that that has passed away. It may be, you know, a grandparent. Um, it, or if, if it's not a family member, I'll tell them they can pick someone from society, you know, a singer that they looked up to or or something like that. But they, and it doesn't even have to be a deceased person. If, if they don't want to even go that route, then I just say pick someone you idealize. And then from that point on, they need to come up with symbols that uh, describe this person and so they'll have symbols for the eyes you know maybe so say they pick grandma grandma passed away a couple years ago grandma always had yellow roses growing in her garden they could do yellow roses for the eyes um, they'll do things with like their birthstone colors or a lot of Roman numerals with anniversaries birthdays death days and so the first thing the student does is just um, I have them do a word web where they just start writing down words or things that remind them of this person and start trying to figure out how you can map that out on a face. And I have a skull they can put these symbols on. Um, but yeah, the first thing is researching and they even have like an interview page where they can take this interview page and interview, you know, mom about grandma or interview grandpa about, you know, grandma. And so they can interview. So they have a couple days to research and um, look different things up before we actually start just getting into the process. Excellent. What is your role during all of that uh, student activity to ensure their success? Uh, just making sure that they emotionally are safe it, because it is heavy. And so you just want to be, you know, are you doing okay? Is Do you need help with this? Do you want to talk about this? Because it, it does bring up some emotions, but I've never had a negative experience with it. I've never had anyone break down. Um, I'd say almost 100% it's been positive, you know, that I've been aware of. Um, but yeah, just uh, helping research because I made so many, I tell them like, okay, well, t if you can't think of anything, tell me a little bit about grandma. And so they'll start talking to me about grandma and I'll say, did grandma have a pet? Okay, she had a bird, let's do something with a bird. And so kind of just bounce ideas off me, bounce emotions off me, whatever you need me for, I'm a presence. Wonderful. Um so it seems like an incredible uh, project, what have you. Are there ways that you would like to grow it even further or um, things that you would like to do um, for the next time you would teach it to continue um, its progression? That's a good question. I feel like I've, I've changed it a little bit every year that I've done it. Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. I, it did grow into 
being part of a collaboration with the Spanish class. I really liked that a lot. Say maybe if it just continued to extend into other classrooms or maybe if it was, you know, we do display it, maybe if it was on an even bigger display than just like the school library, maybe if it was like a community display, I think would be really cool, especially because it's, you know, talking about different cultures, uh, it, you know, and different populations that we have in Edmond. Yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> I, would have, I could probably look into that. Awesome. Love it. Love any time we can, we can probe you, uh, to do a little bit more to, or to think about it a little bit differently. No, it's been like great conversation. So we have, we have our, our last section, the exit ticket, which is the same four questions that we ask every guest every week. And question number one, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? Oh my gosh. Just, just love being there. Love, love the students. You know, remember that you're there for them. I would just say, you just you have to come in and put the students first and and if you can't do that it's probably time to like not not leave but fix things you know and if you can't fix it then probably leave but you just you have to always have the kids in mind you just have to i think we we need to hear that over and over and over again not to leave not to give up but to shift yeah you do, it doesn't it's not you know burnout is not a death sentence it's it's really not um you know, I think we've all been there. I mean, statistically, we have. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, yes. I mean, there are, you know, there are things you can do before you give up. So, but yeah, put the kids first. And if you're struggling, get help. That doesn't help. Make some changes. Move on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking kind of of, of mindset wise, what's a, a piece of advice that sticks with you? And it could be from a kid, a colleague, or even a supervisor? Oh my gosh. Okay. That's good. Um, I would say, so this is a long story, a podcast for another time. Um, but I was in a really bad car accident when I was 21 and, uh, I was running in college at the time and it ended my college running career. Um, but I tried, I tried to come back and my goodness, I, I, you know, I, after I was bed rest for two months and I did my P, uh, my PT, like, or my physical therapy. I just, I went through it like that. And I, every day I was like, I just want to run again. I just want to run again. And, um, I, I did my best. I was so weak. I shattered my pelvis and it, it was, it was really rough on my body, but it happened in May. I was released in October to run. I tried to run my butt off until January. Finally, I went to my coach my college coach, J.D. Martin, he's an amazing man. And I said, coach, um, I don't think I can do it. I, I tried and I, I don't think I'm going to come back. And he said, I always knew the accident was the end for you, kid. You just needed something to believe in. And it still like makes me emotional. Um, but I would just say, um, make people have something to believe in every day. Thank you for sharing that. Because yeah. <laughs> One we can tell is it's very emotional and and that message couldn't be couldn't be more important. We've had so many of our guests say just just show up, just be there every day for the kids and and you clearly are that for for your students and now for the not only the students in your classroom but the the teammates that you're coaching as well and 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 you may not be the one competing but you're you're passing that that legacy on a, as a coach. So it's, yes, it's great that you're definitely, doing that. Yeah, that was the end of my running career, that conversation. But, you know, then my coaching career started and, and I figured out pretty quickly, you know, that chapter was just over because this chapter needed to start. And so now, you know, in the words of J.D. Martin, you know, I, I needed something to believe in. And so now, you know, I try to give the people that need something to believe in something to believe in, whether it's real or not, whether it's going to happen or not. Sometimes we just need something to believe in. I think when they talk about educators having all these different hats, one of my favorite is being a hope dealer. And that just kind of sums up very much um, what you have to share. So very cool. Thanks yeah. for sharing. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to get emotional. Oh, okay. It's a very, uh, <laughs> but it was, I mean, definitely some of the best advice I ever got in my life. So. Well, we appreciate you sharing that with us. So kind of on that note of, of topics you've talked about here in these questions, when we're in those extremely stressful times of the school year, report cards, conferences, 
Um, you know, all those events that pile up on top of us prepping for the art show. Uh, what is something <laughs> that you can you can say to teachers to help power up and, and kind of rise above that struggle? Oh, I would just say, like, when, when all of that stuff piles up like that, I just tell myself, like, this isn't my life. Like, you know, report cards and, and, and conferences and all of that stuff. That's not your life. You go home to, you know, the life you've built and the family you have and all of those things. And so when things get really overwhelming like that, I just try to simplify things and say, you know, like, you know, the kids are safe. They're having a good time in the classroom. That's my main priority. Everything else will get done in time. This is not my life. I don't need to give up my life to make sure that this is done. This will get done as long as everybody's happy and everybody, is, well, may, they may not be happy, <laughs> but as long as everybody is safe and and I, I, all of that paperwork, all of that stuff, it'll get resolved in its own time. So I would just say when things get like that, just retreat back to your life and pri reprioritize. I think we, again, need to hear that all throughout the time. And, and whether that's <laughs> our own um, interests, whether it's family, friends, all of those type things. I, I think what you said with simplify is a really hard thing to do but a great way to address it yeah yes it is and I, I don't think anyone wants to hear a teacher say like this is not my life but it's not we have our own lives and 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 that is work and it w and it will get solved at work but i'm going home and i'm eating dinner and i'll wake up and i'll handle it tomorrow but i'm going home to my life absolutely so you have shared some awesome things uh, in our interview, and sadly, it's coming to an end. But uh, if anyone wants to reach out or follow along or um, kind of continue the conversation with you, what would be the best way for them to get in contact? Um, probably my Instagram. Is that weird? Do people give their Instagram sure, handles? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, it's just at, and then my name, Kara Bowerman, um, would be the best way, other than emailing me, but my school inbox is already pretty, you know, <laughs> full, so <laughs> I'd say if they want to follow along, my art, I post my art um, on there, I post student art sometimes on there in, in the school year, and uh, a lot of my dogs, a lot of that Vishla and Boston Terrier are on there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kara. This, is, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, your students and your faculty are clearly extremely lucky to have you as a part of, of, of their community, um, inspiring them to, to be artists or inspiring them just to have fun and take risks while they're, while they're in class with you. So thanks again for everything that you shared. Everything that Kara talked about, her links to her social media handle can be found on our website at powereduup.com slash show 30. This is show 30, Matt. Um, We've hit another decade of numbers here, if that's a way to say that. And so, Kara, seriously, thanks again. We had a lot of fun. Um, thanks for jumping on with us in the middle of summer. And we look forward to continuing to follow your journey and, and what you do for students. And so, Matt, why don't you, uh, why don't you sign us off? Uh, Kara, you left us feeling very powered up, but we're going to power down this episode um, at this time. Thank you for, for the time, everyone. Hopefully you're all well, enjoying the, the last few weeks of summer and ready to get back in the classroom and, and make this upcoming year one of the best uh, possible. So thank you so much, and we will talk to you next week. Thanks, guys.